Hello, welcome to our YouTube video presentation on period 7, 1890, 1945, the development of foreign policy. The United States is about to emerge as a world power coming into the 20th century. So we're going to look at the steps that the United States took in order to uh, become that, that world uh, leader that they are today and why they did it, and also look at some of the negative uh, consequences that also come from that as well. Uh, we're going to be in 7.3, even though this is the first lecture of period 7, because, hey, I like things in chronological order. Uh, the key concepts don't necessarily always go in chronological order, so just pay attention that this is where we're at here in 7.3. Here the United States is thinking about what is its position in the world? How does it influence its power? Uh, should it do it? This becomes a debate in the late stages of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Um, and not everyone agreed on this. Most people believed since the time of George Washington, our foreign policy was based on the concept of, well, what do you remember what he talked about in his farewell address? When he talked about beware of entangling alliances with foreign nations he passed a Neutrality Act in 1793. He did not want the United States involved in the French Revolution. So neutrality. America believes in two things, neutrality and isolationism. The United States isolates itself from Europe. We have the mighty, the, the massive Atlantic Ocean. At technology of the time period, the United States did not worry about the wars and all that was going on in Europe. So they have actually two oceans they feel that protects them, the Pacific Ocean as well. Now, some people argue that the Monroe Doctrine is the beginning of America getting involved in world affairs and European affairs. And to some extent, yes. But if you think about it, the Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe, written by the greatest Secretary of State ever. Remember, John Quincy Adams actually wrote it. It's more of a defense doctrine. After the Napoleonic Wars... Uh, Europe had kind of uh, recollected itself, and some European nations were thinking about colonies again. And Latin America had established its independence. Many of those Latin American countries start to emerge. The United States decided that this would be an act of aggression against the United States if European powers were allowed to come back. So making a secret deal with the British, if you, you know, John Quincy Adams, he was always good at this. Um, made sure that they put out there a statement that the United States would defend the Western Hemisphere. They would see any act of in inclusion by the by European powers as perhaps maybe an act of war. Europe really didn't take this seriously, but Europe never does actually come back to the Americas. So this is, again, more of a defense doctrine. This is going to become very important to us, though, later in this very lecture. We're going to talk about this Monroe Doctrine and how one particular president in the beginning of the 20th century will utilize it to his own advantage. Moving along here. So how do we begin to move away from isolationism? Well, there are different individuals in America who are thinking globally. Men like Captain Alfred Thayer May Mahan, Thayer Mahan. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who we're going to talk about. Secretary of State John Hay. Uh, these individuals are thinking that the United States is ready to step onto the world stage. Uh, they become known as imperialist. This is a time period where Europe is carving up the continent of Africa. Europe is taking over what they call spheres of influence in China. Uh, much of the world is being either influenced or colonized by European powers. So America feels it's time for it to join into that fray. Uh, they cite several reasons. Imperialists believe this is great economic opportunities. Both our manufacturing and our agricultural products can go over the world, and by selling our, our, our fruits of our labor and, and the manufacturing technology that America has developed, this is a great economic opportunity. Some also think of these racial theories. Uh, Maybe in world history, you remember white man's burden. This idea that Europe and now the United States 
has this burden to bring culture and to bring civilization and to bring Christianity to the rest of the world that is not white. That's why it's known as a racist theory, in all honesty. And again, competition with European empires. Uh, Germany is new to the scene as well. The German nation emerges in the 1880s, and when it comes to be a power, that brings in all this competition. Germany wants these colonies. They've never had it. So that's where you have the Berlin Conference of 1885, where they that's where they begin to decide to carve up Africa. The United States at that time didn't want to be part of it, but by the 1890s, another issue that the imperialists talked about, no more manifest destiny. The Western frontier is closed. So they now argue their new destiny is to expand their culture and American institutions the world over. This is what Americans need to do. Um, Hawaii becomes one of the first territories that the United States will claim overseas. Now, America has a long history with the Hawaiian Islands, starting mostly with New England missionaries coming over there to preach the word of God, but eventually agriculture. If you've ever been in a grocery store, and I'm going to assume some of you have, you might have noticed a company called Dole. You see a lot of the cans, Dole Pineapple and Dole Peaches. And, well, Mr. Dole was a real guy. And he had pineapple plantations and sugar plantations in Hawaii. And him and some others felt that, you know, it'd be nice if Hawaii wasn't its own independent country and kept taxing us. So these individuals, when Grover Cleveland is president, were able to convince Marines that were stationed there to help overthrow the Hawaiian government. The Queen of Hawaii will be overthrown um, by businessmen. And Grover Cleveland was powerless to do anything to stop that. And eventually Hawaii becomes a territory of the United States. And, you know, we all know now it's the 50th state of the United States. So, but it, it didn't come in a way that most Hawaiians would really have liked it, if you think about it. Uh, I mentioned Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan. He's a captain in the United States Navy. He writes a book at this time, 1890, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. Now think about those dates, 1660 through 1783. What nation would have the most influence upon the sea at that time period? Now if you're thinking it's the United States, uh, no. The United States isn't a country in 1660. We're still colonies. However, we're colonies to the mother country that is the power. Ah, see, I knew someone back there. I see, I see you all saying it now. It's Great Britain, yes. Great Britain becomes the model for the United States. Great Britain come to rule much of the world because of its massive navy. So this book, The Influence of Sea Power, Captain Mahan is encouraging the United States government to build a modern navy uh, with complete with battleships, the new great technology of the time period, building these modern dreadnoughts or battleships. And that's how you maintain your influence. And 1890, interestingly, interestingly, is also the same year that Jacob Riss publishes his How the Other Half Lived. Uh, you have one group of Americans who are thinking, looking internally at America. Let's look at how we have to fix our problems at home like with immigrants. Others are looking externally. They're looking outside of America, like Mahan. No, we've got to build an empire now. We've got to have overseas territories. That's how we become a great nation. And these two things come into conflict throughout the 20th century. So at times, or at the same time, anti-imperialists also are the rise. They do not want to see the United States go against the foreign policy of isolationism. They argue this is the tradition of Washington. The United States does not do this. The United States as a republic believes in self-determination. Individuals, whatever country they're in, whatever stage of civilization they're in, have the right to self-determine. The United States or no nation should impose their will upon them. They also talk about, well, this is all a bunch of racist theories. 
That's the only reason why you want to go out there, and America should not do that. I mean, America is only about 30 years since they ended slavery. Why do they now want to go out there to the world and oppose their, their will upon people who are not of the same race or the same color? It seemed very suspicious to them. An anti-imperialistic league is formed at this time period. Mark Twain is just happens to, he's not the leader of it, but he's the perhaps one, the most famous individual. And we are going to do an article in class that's going to discuss his involvement uh, a little bit more in detail. You may remember William Jennings Bryan in the election of 1896. Uh, he ran against William McKinley. Right? Remember William Jennings Bryan, the Cross of Gold speech, the Populist Party, the Wizard of Oz. Here we are four years later. He runs against William McKinley again. He's still preaching his 16 to 1 silver, by the way. He's never going to necessarily give that up. But he's now added anti-imperialistic rhetoric to his campaign. Because a war takes place in 1898, two years before this election. And Brian and others are very concerned that America is losing its way. Brian does not believe the United States should become imperialistic. Brian and many, many, many others believe in this principle of isolationism. Of course, this is his second time running for president. And, uh, well, yeah, you know, he loses again to the same guy, William McKinley. Well, what was it that upset William McKinley? Well, it was the war. The Spanish-American War takes place. It's America's... I would say one of our forgotten wars. It is a declared war. Uh, it is, at this point in time, only the third declared war in American history. Let's see. Here's a good review question for you. Do you remember the first two declared wars? Hmm. No, 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 not the American Revolution. We weren't a country yet, but then, you know, I understand. Say, so, nope, sorry, not the Civil War. We don't declare war on ourselves. No, no, no. I'm glad that you're guessing, though. Um. Uh, Yes, the War of 1812 is the first time we did it. Yes. And then the second time, oh, very good. Yes, the Mexican-American War. So those were two declared wars already. This is now our third, the Spanish-American War. Why do we declare war here? Well, it it's not an easy answer. <laughs> it's not an easy answer. Uh, I, you could really study the Spanish-American War in a college class, perhaps, for an entire semester, uh, there's a lot of things going on here. America's desire to go overseas. America's desire to be more involved in world affairs. You have the island nation of Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. That's under Spanish rule. Spanish insurrectos, these individuals who are trying to get their own independence, uh, have been trying to influence American policy for a while to help them. The Philippines, also under command of the Spanish. The Philippines are just a few miles off the coast of China. Wouldn't it be great to have a base in the Philippines where we can easily trade with China? Hmm. Spain is a dying world empire. There are talks of horrible atrocities taking place in Cuba and in the Philippines. Uh, death camps. that Spain maintains death camps. Uh, Spain uh, oppresses the people of the Philippines. They oppress the people of Cuba. This is getting out more and more and more into the, the American psyche. Uh, there are journalists. Uh, we talked about them in class. William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer. They're running daily articles in their newspapers about some of the horrible things that the Spanish are doing to Cuba and to the Philippines. Uh, this was known as yellow journalism, this idea of exaggerating some of these things. Some of the stories they put in there are completely false. They tell a story of one moment when a passenger liner, which is the cruise ship of their time period, in the Caribbean is stopped by a Spanish naval ship because they know there's a woman on there who is actually a spy. They get on board the ship. They find the woman. They bring her on the top of the deck. They have everybody on the cruise ship on the deck to watch, and they strip search her in front of everyone. 
That was in every American newspaper. The only problem is, it's fake news. It was totally fake. Uh, well, not totally fake. They did stop the passenger liner. They did believe there was a woman who was a spy for the American government on the boat. But they went down below the boat, and female Spanish officers simply interrogated her, never strip-searched her. But see, that was exaggerated. That's why it's called yellow journalism. It was exaggerated. So it got Americans angry. The United States sent a battleship to Havana, uh, the USS Maine, just to see what was going on, to flex its muscles. You know, we have the Monroe Doctrine, right? Why do we still have Spain and Cuba? It's violating the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, is there really atrocities going on? So this battleship arrives in Havana, the USS Maine, and then it blows up. It explodes. And of course, the newspapers immediately say that Spain sabotaged the boat. And what was this? They came up with a slogan Remember the Maine and to hell with Spain. And the United States government met and they decided, yeah, Spain probably attacked us. They probably blew up our ship. This is an act of war. And they declared war on Spain, beginning the Spanish American War. 1898, our shortest war ever. It lasts from April to August, in just a few months. Uh, it's not until the 1970s, by the way, after studying the wreckage of the Maine for that long, they began to realize it was a total accident. Uh, it was a human error, a uh, part of the, the, the naval personnel, that a spark happened in the lower decks of the ship where their torpedoes were, and that ignited the torpedoes and blew the ship up. It was never sabotaged on the part of the Spanish. It took us 70-some years later to figure it out, but hey, you know what? My bad. My bad. So the United States declares war on Spain and immediately attacks the Philippines. Uh, they have a fleet out in the Pacific Ocean, and that actually becomes the first target. They go after their Commodore Dewey and his ships, take out the Spanish Navy there. It should be noted, the United States has a modern fleet, a metal fleet, just like we think of today, not quite as sophisticated as our ships today, but it is a metal fleet. Spain still has a wooden fleet. There, this, this was a no contest. Uh, when the American fleet was heading towards Cuba, uh, they met resistance with a Spanish fleet. There was a wooden fleet. And within 10, 15 minutes, they set the fleet on fire, uh, the Spanish fleet. As American sailors were cheering, the, the captain of the American fleet famously said, Stop cheering, boys. Those sons of bitch are dying. Get in there and save them. And the battle might have lasted 10, 15 minutes, but the rescue mission lasted more than an hour, saving as many Spanish sailors as they could. This was, a, this was really a lopsided war. The United States government is still with this idea of, do we really want to impose our will upon other people? So as you're getting a war, um, like one of these war bills are being passed, uh, you might remember we talked about this before. Again, here's another review question. When they get these war appropriations, where you're raising money to fight a war. Let's think back to the Mexican-American War. They're raising money to build their army to invade Mexico, and that David Wilmot wanted to add an amendment. Right? It became the Wilmot Proviso, that any land they took from Mexico would remain free soil, no slavery. That never passed. Enter the Teller Amendment. Here, responding to President McKinley's message, Congress passed a joint resolution in April, uh, April 20th, authorizing this war. Part of that resolution would be this Teller Amendment. See, uh, Teller, a member of Congress, wanted to make sure the United States would have no intention of ever taking control of the island of Cuba, and that once peace would be established on the island, once they beat the Spanish and drive them out of Cuba, and they would establish peace and restore peace to the island, the Cuban people would control their own government. So remember that. The Teller Amendment 
was a declaration that Cuba would stay independent. They don't have one for the Philippines. Interesting. Um, like I said, this war is a quick war. Theodore Roosevelt is the Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Navy. He is delighted about this war. He quits as the uh, second, uh, Assistant Secretary. He forms his own volunteer army, the Rough Riders. Well, he helps to form it, but he realizes he has no military experience, so he gets a friend of his, a Colonel Leonard Wood, to be the actual colonel of this, of this all-volunteer cavalry known as the Rough Riders. They train in Arizona mostly, and then they head off to Tampa. Tampa became the largest staging area for an invasion in American history. Uh, the only problem is they didn't really have the infrastructure to leave Tampa. The ships, uh, the communications, getting everything coordinated became a nightmare. So when Theodore's Rough Riders left, they weren't allowed to bring their horses. So they actually fought as dismounted cavalry. But they became famous for their charges up Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt saw battle. He became he was lieutenant colonel, and by the end of the uh, by the end of the Spanish American War, he was he was raised to the rank of colonel. Um, which again, he was already pretty famous in America. This only just made him more famous. Theodore Roosevelt running up the sides of mountains, basically, to take on the Spanish. When the war is over, there were some who were thinking, okay, yes, the Teller Amendment tells us that we have to respect the sovereignty of Cuba. It's got to be independent. However, they get another amendment added on here called the Platt Amendment. Uh, the United States troops are going to remain in Cuba from 1898 to 1901, but once Congress withdraws those troops, um, it becomes conditional upon Cuba that they must accept the terms of what is known as the Platt Amendment. And it's basically four things. And again, that's why I have this review sheet is on Edmodo, and I wrote the four things there. So if I say it and I go too fast, just make sure you print out that sheet so you know. Cuba can never sign a treaty with a foreign power that would impair its own independence. That's the first thing. Cuba is never to build up an excessive debt. They don't want Cuba to go into debt. That's number two. Cuba must permit the United States to interfere in Cuban affairs in order to preserve its independence and maintain law and order. So, yes, Cuba, you can be independent, but the United States has the right to come in and intervene anytime in your affairs, anytime we want. And the last thing is the, they have to allow the United States to maintain a naval base in Cuba, which is Guantanamo Bay. Uh, you may have heard of it because the United States is still there. That's the one part of the Platt Amendment the United States still hang, hangs on to is Guantanamo Bay is a United States naval base. <clears throat> so make sure you know the difference between these two amendments. You may have noticed I went very quickly through the Spanish-American War because it only lasted a few months and it really isn't that big of a war. It's just a few battles in Cuba and it's all over. Well, what's the open-door policy? Well, the United States comes out of the Spanish-American War feeling all great. They now have overseas colonies. They, have, they already have Hawaii. Now they have the Philippines. Uh, Cuba is a, a protectorate. It's going to be independent, but it's... You know, the United States has influence there. Puerto Rico and Guam are also added to the United States. Well, they want to trade with China. Now that they're in the Philippines, let's trade with China. But the problem is the European powers won't allow it. You've got France, Great Britain, Russia, Germany. They all have what's called spheres of influence. They have these sections of China Let's say there's a section in China where only the German government can trade with China there. Nobody else can trade in this part of China with Germany. Great Britain has their part, or their sphere of influence, as they called it, thereby closing competition to trade. The United States doesn't have any part in China, but they want to trade. So Secretary of State John Hay wrote an open diplomatic letter to the world. He called it the open door policy. He called on the fact that the Chinese people deserve the right to be able to trade freely with anyone that they want. So the open door policy is a plea with the world 
to allow open and free trade with all of China. Now, much of Europe laughed at the United States over this, but since no European power denounced the open door policy, at least publicly, the United States declared this a victory and began to feel that they could, in fact, trade with China whenever they wanted. Well, mention the fact that there is no amendment giving the Philippine people their independence. The United States has decided that the Filipino people cannot rule themselves. Uh, William McKinley, there's a moment, William McKinley is a devout Christian, and he believes at times that he can pray hard enough and that God gives him answers. And there is a moment when McKinley prayed hard over the Philippines. He, he believed, as many others at the time, mostly in the Republican Party, believed that to allow the Philippine people that never ruled themselves just complete freedom could become disastrous. And their idea was that the United States would rule the Philippines only for a few decades and gradually give over their, the independence to the Filipino people. There were a lot of people in the Philippines that did not like this. And when they fought with the Americans to overthrow the Spanish, they now fight against the Americans. The Filipino War, 1900 to 1901, one of the most bloodiest wars in American history. It's, some historians have talked about it's very reminiscent, even though it's a much shorter war, to that of the Vietnam War. It's a jungle war. A lot of horrible atrocities are committed on both sides. Uh, and it's one of the wars I think America doesn't like to talk about at all. It's not a declared war. It's an undeclared war. And if you remember Buffalo soldiers, uh, black soldiers were used predominantly here. And W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, men like him and the NAACP, they denounced this war as a race war. And they, they fought heavily against it. In fact, many of the black soldiers that went to fight in the Philippines, they deserted. I think there's some close to 2,000 black troops who left the United States Army and fought on the side of the Philippines. Uh, this was a very complex, very harsh war. But in the end, the United States wins, and they do maintain their sovereignty over the Philippines until World War II. Insular cases. Here you have a situation now. The United States government has taken overseas countries, or territories, I should say. Does that mean the United States Constitution goes with it? Do people of Guam, do people of Puerto Rico, the people of the Philippines, do they get all the protections on the United States Constitution? Well, in a series of Supreme Court cases, there's more than one, but they're collectively called the insular. Insular is a word that means island. So the island cases. The United States Supreme Court said not automatically. You cannot give full uh, constitutional privileges to individuals who are not citizens of the United States. There could be some, but not full. So the insular cases show that where the flag might be planted, the Constitution doesn't necessarily go with it. So here's a picture of Theodore Roosevelt right there in the center. That's him as Colonel of the Rough Riders. They're on top of San Juan Hill. Uh, he's taking a picture. They, they just fought their way up Kettle Hill, and they took that hill. And now a combined effort of Buffalo soldiers and, and, and actual Army infantry and these Rough Riders now take San Juan Hill. And when it was all over, Roosevelt wanted a picture with his troopers. And this is one of these famous pictures in American history. Here is a cartoon depicting Uncle Sam standing over China, and the European countries are trying to carve up their spheres of influence, and he's got his open note there saying, no, 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 no. You know, we've got to have free trade. By the way, in the background, that's Japan. Even the cartoons at the time period could be a little racist. Japan is a growing world empire at this time period. And I'll start talking about this more in class. The United States tries to get along with Japan, it's not going to do so good, and it's eventually, as we all know, is going to be the catalyst for America's entry into World War II. William McKinley easily wins his re-election in 1900, 
And in just a few months, he is assassinated by a anarchist, Leo Chagas. Uh, and it just shocked the United States. Uh, but his vice president, although saddened by it, not necessarily shocked by it, or, or I would say too upset because it's Theodore Roosevelt. You should know that William McKinley did not die immediately. Um, he is assassinated, but he dies a few days later due to gangrene from the, from the bullets. And now Theodore Roosevelt's president of the United States. And we get one of the craziest uh, enthusiastic characters in all of American history is Theodore Roosevelt. We're going to talk a lot about him throughout period seven in the early part. He is a Republican, but he will embrace progressivism. He is a big game hunter, but he believes in conservation and protection of wildlife. Uh, he's, he's a multimillionaire, but he's going to do everything he can to protect the common man. He is, he is an enigma wrapped in a puzzle surrounded by, you know, all kinds of question marks. It's just, I truly enjoy Theodore Roosevelt. Others do not. As President of the United States now, though, he is going to make a foreign policy that no other president ever even thought of. He'll initially call it his big stick policy. He, there's an African proverb, speak softly, but carry a big stick. In other words, try to negotiate, try to try to have peace, but if the person won't have peace, hit them in the head with your big stick. For Theodore Roosevelt, his big stick is the United States Navy. Um, he will build up the United States Navy. He will paint the battleship solid white, and he'll call it his great white fleet. He does really like the color white. It is Theodore Roosevelt who paints the executive mansion all white and begins to demand that you call the executive mansion the White House. Thank you, Theodore. Now we can never stop calling it the White House. We do it retroactively, even though when John Adams, the first man to, to serve in the executive mansion, it was known as the executive mansion, but we call it the White House always because of what Theodore Roosevelt does. So here's Theodore Roosevelt's idea. The Caribbean and Latin America that's America's playground, and no other country should be able to come in here. This is where the Monroe Doctrine comes back to play. We said earlier, the Monroe Doctrine, the defense doctrine, keep European powers out of Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, Roosevelt's corollary to that, and the word corollary means to add on and add on to the doctrine, is that yes, European powers stay out, but I go in anytime I want, and he will. Anytime he thinks a, Europe, a, a Latin American country or a Caribbean nation isn't doing what needs to be done to protect its own sovereignty, which is, in his mind, a danger to American sovereignty, here come the Marines, here comes the Navy. Boom, boom, boom. The one thing Roosevelt wants the most is a Panama Canal. Uh, and he's going to do everything he can to get this Panama Canal made. Panama at the time was not an independent nation. It was part of Colombia. When he tried to buy Panama from the Colombians, they said no. Roosevelt convinced the Panamanians that they were being oppressed and started a revolution. And then he sent in the Marines. And it ended, and Panama is independent, and they wind up selling the rights to build a canal to the American government. Theodore is so happy that he went there himself to work on the construction. There he is in 1904. That's how Theodore Roosevelt thought of the world. Um, there's some other things in here I didn't put in the PowerPoint. Japan and Russia go to war. You have the Russian, what's known as the Russo-Japanese War takes place. And it's a devastating war for the Russians because they're losing the war. It's a devastating war for Japan because they're running out of money, winning the war. But neither side will quit. Roosevelt orders the diplomats from both countries to meet him on his private yacht. And he negotiates peace. He brings an end to the Japanese-Russo War. And he becomes the first United States president to win the Nobel Peace Prize because of it. So Roosevelt is making sure the United States government has an influence in the world. 
sometimes very positively, sometimes maybe not so positively. Uh, we'll move on quickly here. William Taft is the successor of Theodore Roosevelt. He did not believe in big stick uh, policy. He thought that was a little bit too heavy handed. His became known as dollar diplomacy, using American investments. Go to Latin America, go to Central America and invest. Uh, bring corporations in. Go to China and invest in China. American dollars will come and thereby boost up the economies of these countries and everybody will love us. Eh, that didn't always work either. His corporations came and corporations have a way of taking advantage of individuals. Uh, the one place where it didn't work at all was in Manchuria, which is a part of China. Even though Japan and Russia are not at war anymore, they still are eyeing Manchuria. When the United States government offers to build a railroad there, uh, both countries, Russia and Japan, saw that as an act of war. So dollar diplomacy did not work there. It it's questionable if it worked anywhere, to be honest with you, but that became the foreign policy of William Taft. And then we get to Woodrow Wilson and his moral diplomacy. Woodrow Wilson is our only college professor president, the only president to hold a PhD. Uh, and he's a very self-righteous individual. He didn't like big stick and he didn't like dollar. He felt that America had a moral obligation to teach the world American standards and American principles. Uh, and again, you might see here the cartoon of Wilson. We can have no sympathy with those who seek to seize the power of government to advance their own personal interests or ambitions. And it's like they're children and they're repeat after me. Uh, he believes this is part of the way that you can spread democracy to the world. I will tell you in his first term of office, it's not going to work too well, uh, especially with Mexico. In 1910, Mexico goes into a revolution, and it will last up until World War I, and it will really be a major headache to the United States. One individual after the other will seize control of Mexico, only to be assassinated or driven out of the country. Uh, President Wilson, when he becomes president, he sees some of these guys as butchers and barbarians. There's a bandit named Pancho Villa who begins to invade into the United States, trying to cause America to come after him, which, by the way, we do. We invade Mexico. Woodrow Wilson sends in the army to capture Pancho Villa. Uh, this, is the, this is just before the outbreak of World War I. So there is a lot of tension that will happen with Mexico and the United States. Um, in the end, moral diplomacy will not work. He will try it again in his second term with World War I, or the Great War. Because remember, they didn't call it World War I in the beginning because no one knew there was going to be a sequel, nor would they want to see one. So in the Great War, he will try again to spread democracy in the world. And we're going to talk a lot about that later on in another PowerPoint. I know this went long. Remember, this is a classroom lecture. Don't forget to print out those worksheets off Edmodo, and I'll see everybody you know, in a few days. All right, good night, or good afternoon, good day, whenever it is you're watching this.